My name is Ronnie Tan, and I lead the aquaculture program at the U.S. Greens Council. It's a pleasure to be back here at Los Mochis and at the Aquaculture Congress 2021. My last visit here was actually in 2018. In the next 40 minutes, I will be speaking on the shrimp outlook, the rising feed costs, and opportunities for DDGS. Well, let me start off first by giving you an idea of shrimp production. I'm just going to put on a pointer. I want to take you back to 2018 because this was just before the pandemic. And if we look at global shrimp production, the dark blue bar shows you the production from Southeast Asia, which is 1.7 million tons. The orange bar shows you China, which is approximately 1.5 million tons. But there's a huge discrepancy here in terms of volumes because the industry estimates is only 500,000 tons. The gray bar shows you India, which has progressed a lot since the year 2010. And in its height in 2018, it produced over 800,000 tons of shrimp. Latin America is certainly headed by or led by Ecuador, which is the largest producer. So if we look at 2019, the total global production should be around 4 million metric tons because we have to take away the overestimation in China. The other interesting thing is to look at this brown line. The peak of prices, these are composite prices, which means that is a composition of uh, prices of head on shell on together with all other products as well. And the height of the prices was in 2013. This is when AHPND hit Thailand and suddenly all the buyers realized that there was a shortage of shrimp. I remember being at the Brussels Seafood Show in April 2013, and everyone was scurrying around. All the buyers were looking for shrimp at that time. But it's just interesting to notice that from here, the prices have come down. So you're looking at lower prices today compared to 2013. Right. But question we have right now is that how has COVID-19 affected the top four producers in the year 2020? Let's start with India. In 2020, when India went into lockdown, a lot of the processing plants had to close. The workers had to travel back to their home states. And when processing plants close, they cannot buy shrimp from farmers. And this is when prices dropped. When farmers found out that prices were low, they decided to skip the cycle and not go into farming. So in 2020, India's production dropped by 16%. Now, what about Ecuador? Again, it was a similar story, but a very different outcome. In Ecuador, Guayaquil was the main, or is the main uh, shrimp processing area. And if you remember, Guayaquil was the center of uh, the pandemic. And workers were afraid to go into the processing plants because there was no way that they could distance themselves. Because in the processing plant, you have to work very close together. Although processing plants didn't have sufficient workers, prices also came down, but farmers continued to produce um, shrimp. So even with low prices, and I remember it was about August 2020, for size 60, the price was below three US dollars, and that is actually below the production cost. But yet Ecuador kept going, and they ended the year 2020 with close to an 8% increase in production. Let's move on to Vietnam. Vietnam was basically a poster child of how to manage COVID-19. And it didn't have that many infections, um, but yet 
the volumes for Vietnam remain stable. And part of the reason for this was because one of the major uh, exporting countries for Vietnam is China. And China had to go into lockdown, they closed their restaurants, and this reduced the demand for shrimp. So we talked about China. Due to the decrease in demand for shrimp, China's local production came down by about 13.5%. But if you remember as well, uh, this was about July 2020. China found COVID-19 on the packaging of imported uh, shrimp. Not in the shrimp itself, but this was in the packaging. And this put off people from eating shrimp. And it also um, increased the inspection of imported shrimp. So this actually created a situation whereby the local production of shrimp improved. So this year, in 2021, we forecast that China's production would increase by approximately 11%. Let's move back to Vietnam for 2021. This year, Vietnam faced COVID-19 and it had high levels of infection. So the processing plants in Vietnam, um, this was an obligation by the government, they had to impose new SOPs called the three in one, which means that workers had to sleep, eat and work at the factory itself. But they couldn't find sufficient accommodation for the workers. So most of the processing plants had to work only at 50% capacity. Now this affects the um, demand by the processing plants and hence prices as well for X farm. But here we are not sure what's going to happen, whether Vietnam will end up in the low end of 700,000 tons or a possible high end of 750,000 tons. So we haven't ended the year yet. So this is our estimation. Let's move on to Ecuador. Ecuador has powered on tremendously. It has pivoted from China, which in 2019, 80% of um, shrimp was exported to China. So when China closed its uh, buying, um, it reduced its buying, Ecuador suffered, but Ecuador managed to pivot very quickly and they changed to, uh, they switched over to exporting to the US as well as to Europe. So they did well. We expect Ecuador to finish very close to 800,000 tons this year, but there are even estimates crossing 900,000 tons. So I've taken the lower figure, but uh, again, it's not the end of the year, so it's very difficult to, to tell what's going to happen. India, on the other hand, India powers on, but still on a limited basis. So it will increase by approximately 10%. So how are we going to end globally for 2021? We think that we will not reach 2019 levels, but we should reach between 3.8 to 3.9 million metric tons, which is an improvement of about 8 to 11% compared to 2020. Let's look at the next nine years up to 2030 and see what happens. We are forecasting that global shrimp production should increase at 3% CAGR, compound annual growth rate. But Latin America will gain market share. If we look at 2008, global production was approximately 3.38 million tons of which Asia dominated with 82% market share. Latin America only had 13% market share. Fast forward to present day, 2021. Global production is at 3.9 million metric tons, but Latin America has increased to 27% market share, while Asia has gone down to 63% market share. 
our forecast to 2030, we expect a production of 5 million metric tons. Latin America will continue to gain market share, reaching 35%, while Asia will reduce to 55%. Question we have to ask ourselves, how has COVID-19 affected the supply chain in 2021? When the lockdown happened in 2020, I'm using US as an example here. Many people learned to cook, many consumers learned to cook seafood at home. And this increased the percentage of shrimp being sold through the retail markets, through supermarkets versus um, the food service. But with vaccination, we expect a lot of dining out when uh, the food service reopens. And in the US, it has reopened already. And what we're seeing is revenge dining out. Basically, people wanting to spend money. And when they do, they tend to go for perhaps the higher end um, meals, which includes seafood, and this will increase the demand for shrimp. While prices are increasing in the consumer markets, basically you have a shortage in the US, um, you have lots of people wanting to do revenge dining out, but yet we find that X farm prices are still low. And why is, this, why is there this mismatch? This is something which is new. Because in the past, global supply versus demand would determine the price, but it doesn't necessarily do that anymore. What determines price is supply chain. Let me explain what I mean. If we look at this supply chain arrow, shrimp in the farm go into the processing plant, then it is placed in containers and, ship, and shipped over to the country of consumption. From farm to processing plant, let me give you an example in Vietnam. When Vietnam imposed its SOPs of the three-in-one, the processing plant capacity dropped. Hence, they were not able to buy um, the same amount of shrimp from the farm and X farm prices dropped. So you have low prices at X farm gate. Assuming that the processing plant is then able to process, they are then able to put it into a container and ship it out to the, cons the consuming country. But this is where we have problems today. In the middle of October, the New York Times published this article about supply chain disruptions. And it explained, or rather it stated that there were 273 ships waiting to enter Los Angeles port on the West Coast. LA port is the main port for Asian shrimp to enter the US. So these 273 ships, if all the containers were placed end to end, it would reach from Los Angeles to Chicago. That's how many containers there are. But think of it, think of the implications. If all these containers are trapped on ships, where are exporters, where are the shrimp um, exporters going to get new containers to come in? So basically, these containers have been trapped, okay? Then, there is port congestion. We've all read about this, and this is the thing slowing everything down. So what happens is that in the US, in-country inventory is low because it cannot go through the ports. It's not only in the US. China is another good example. Um, Pre-COVID-19, a container of shrimp would normally take four days to be cleared. Today, it takes four weeks. It is a combination of the inspection required for COVID-19 on the packaging, and it is also a problem because of the log jam in the port itself. 
So in-country inventory in China is also low and consumer prices are increasing. So what has happened in 2021 in terms of production costs? There have been rising production costs. I'm focusing here on Asia because that's the area that I know best. Disease outbreaks continue, but it is being manageable. manageable. So you're looking at AHP and D, white spot, as well as EHP. But the problem here is that it reduces the uh, survival rates. And this is what is increasing the production costs. The next thing is that we have seen an increase in feed ingredient prices, an example of soybean meal. Prices have increased since the third quarter of 2020. And this has made it difficult for feed millers. So feed millers have to increase their price as well. So here is a table on the right hand side, you see a table here of the increase in shrimp free price prices. If you look at India, um, this is the exchange rate against the US dollar. Okay, We see that in India, the increase has been up to 6.3%. And this is only up to May 2021. There has been further increase since then. Indonesia, an increase of up to 3.5%. China, up to 3.6%. Thailand is unusual and a unique situation because the government does not allow um, feed companies to increase their prices. It is prohibited from doing so and hence it's zero. Vietnam has increased by up to 5.5%. And Vietnam tends to use very high protein uh, feeds, up to 42%. In Malaysia, there has been an increase of 3%. What's going to happen in 2022? We expect energy and other costs to go up as well. So again, rising production cost. Fast forward, let's move to 2022. Our major concern is aquafeed costs. So generally we have seen shrimp feed, sorry, shrimp prices X farm have been declining, but production costs have been increasing and this is squeezing the margins. Next, we have high plant protein prices, both soybean meal as well as corn, and certain feed prices have increased by more than 5%, as you have seen in the last slide. Fish meal is an interesting feed ingredient because the price has remained stable. It is approximately US dollars 1,500. And if everything is equal, a least cost formulation would tend to pull in uh, fish meal into the formulation, but it is limited by fish in fish out ratios. Many feed millers are certified by either BAP, Global Gap, or ASC. And in the certification, it generally states that there has to be a program of reducing fish meal prices um, in the coming years. Okay, So if a um, feed company produces shrimp feed with, let's say, 12% fish meal content, it has to go down on a yearly basis. So if this is the case, how can the shrimp feed segment support industry growth? A shrimp feed with 36% crude protein generally costs about 1.1 US dollars per kilo today. Will we have an impending commodity super cycle? Will soybean meal and corn gluten meal prices increase? It is unsure at this moment, but there is a great possibility. So here is where I would like to introduce corn DDGS as a value for money ingredient. Just to show you a comparison of prices. This is September 2020. This is May 2021. And the price of soybean meal, FOB, has gone up from about 350 US dollars per ton to 550 US dollars per ton. The green line 
shows the price of DDGS. And the red line shows the, the um, difference between the two. So DDGS looks like a value for money ingredient. Let me explain what DDGS is and the products available. DDGS stands for dry distillers grains with solubles. And generally we have two products regular as well as high pro DDGS, which is also known as corn fermented protein. And this is the proximal analysis. With regular, you have a crude protein level of 28%. With high pro or corn fermented protein, it can range from anywhere between 44% right up to 52%. And it really depends on uh, the manufacturer. It is a branded product. With regular DDGS, you generally have a relatively high fat content, which provides energy, while with high pro, it is a lower fat content. In this slide, I'm just going to do a very quick SWOT analysis, a strength, weakness, opportunities, and threat analysis for DDGS. Let's have a look at the strengths first. I mentioned two products, so it has a mid-tier protein content of 28% for the regular and a 49% crude protein for the high pro. The good part here is that both products do not compete with each other. The regular DDGS is very good for freshwater fish like tilapia, while the high pro is very good for high crude protein feeds like shrimp and marine fish. So if you were to ask me to put a, a, a sort of border figure, I would say that a feed with less than 34% crude protein would take in regular DDGS um, because it provides value, while a crude protein feed of above 34% crude protein would uh, take in the high pro. The other thing interesting is that because of the fermentation process, it has a lot of available phosphorus. And this is very good in reducing pollution uh, in the lake. So a lot of tilapia is grown in lakes today. And the pollution comes from uneaten feed, as well as the feces from the tilapia, from any fish. And phos phosphorus is one of the major polluting um, components. So if it's in the uneaten feed, it would cause eutrophication, eutrophication. And if it was in the feces, it would also do the same. So the available phosphorus would help the absorption in um, the fish itself. DDGS also contains a high level of yeast and beta-glucans, approximately 10% in regular DDGS and up to 25% in high-pro DDGS. And this is perfect for immune boosting. We must remember that shrimp has a very primitive immune system. So once it falls uh, ill in a disease outbreak, it stops eating. So there is no way that we can provide any therapeutic solution for it because how do you deliver the therapy to the shrimp? So prevention is much better than cure in this case. Xanthophil. DDGS has a high xanthophil content and it provides a very good coloration for shrimp. In Asia, especially in the China market, shrimp with a dark color, which means that it turns red after cooking, is very much sought after. And there is a premium price placed on this. And um, if we're looking at a certain color code or a color number, the market tends to use the DSM color fan, the same one that they use for salmon. And we're looking at a color of about 29 and above. And here, the xanthophil will help. Um, I've just learned that the zeaxanthin in DDGS 
can be converted to astaxanthin. It does take time, but it can be done. So this would help provide a much better coloration for the shrimp after cooking. Where are the weaknesses with DDGS? There has been rather poor past experience, and this is linked to the very high variability in terms of its proximate analysis. But since then, the technology in producing DDGS, regular DDGS, has improved so much that today the variance is very small. But I would say the biggest weakness in using DDGS for aquaculture is actually the lack of research data, especially in shrimp. Um, there is still quite a lot of work to do out there. And I will share some more research data with you in the next few slides. In terms of threats, there has been talk about mycotoxins because when you produce DDGS, you actually concentrate the, uh, if there are mycotoxins in the corn, it is then concentrated. But the mycotoxin actually depends on the source of corn. And um, the US corn prides itself in quality. So the mycotoxin threat is very, very minor because the US government, as well as your US Grains Council, manages and also uh, inspects all the corn for mycotoxins. There's also been a talk about feeding uh, DDGS to whitefish like Pangasius. And there has been um, a thought that it could create a very yellow fillet. I, there is no science to substantiate this, and I think this is a myth. We have tested DDGS with tilapia. We have gone as high as 33% inclusion rates over a long period of time, and I think this is over three months of feeding, and we have not found any yellowing of the fillet or the flesh at all. So again, I would question this threat. I wanted to show you some research data that has been done with using DDGS in Little Pinares Venomae. And this was the work that was done by um, Romy Novriadi, who is a lead researcher with the Ministry of Fisheries in Indonesia, Erwin Suendi, who is the chief nutritionist at Jatva Comfit, the second largest producer of shrimp feed in Indonesia, and myself. And here is the diet composition. If you look at the amount of corn DDGS, we had the control with 0% DDGS, 5%, 10%, and 15%. But what did this replace? We replaced soybean meal, and we replaced wheat flour, okay? The final feed is isonitrogenous and isocalorific. Sorry, I forgot to mention, the average crude protein for this feed is around 36 to 37% protein, and the crude fat is around 7 to 8%. Now, we wanted to simulate, this is a tank trial, but we wanted to simulate this with a commercial operation. And we had to do a two-stage trial because we had to ensure very good survival rates, at least 70%, and good growth of at least 250% body weight gain. If we did this in just one tank trial, I don't think we would be able to achieve this. So we did it in two different stages. Stage one, we started with one gram shrimp and we grew it up to 10 grams. And this was done at the Batam Research Center in Indonesia with a trial period of 52 days at a density equivalent to 150 shrimp per square meter. In stage two, we started with five gram shrimp. 
in order to grow it up to 19 grams. And here we did it in Jump Fast Research Center. The trial period was 84 days and the density was relatively high. We did it at about 250 pieces per square meter. So in stage one, from one gram, with a final weight of 10 grams, these were the survival rates, the weight gain, and the FCR. And what is interesting is to see that comparing with the control, all the treatment diets showed no significant difference with the control. So basically, up to 10 grams, we can substitute DDGS at 15% in a shrimp feed diet, and you wouldn't see any negative effect on the performance. In stage two, we used exactly the same feeds, the control and up to 15% DDGS. And we achieved final weights of close to 19 grams. The survival rates range from about 66% to about 71%. And the weight gain was certainly over 250%. FCRs were approximately two. And again, statistically, there was no significant difference between a 15% DDGS inclusion compared to the control. And the conclusion here, oh, sorry, before we, are, we arrive at the conclusion. So we had to show what is the advantage of DDGS? When we started this trial, which was the 29th of July, 2020, the formulation cost of zero DDGS was 8,680 rupia, Indonesian rupia per kilogram. And this is the exchange rate. With 15% inclusion rate of DDGS, we were able to save nearly 2% in terms of the formulation cost. Now you remember I said that when it came to May, soybean meal prices had increased tremendously. So on the 1st of April, we revalued the feed using exactly the same feed ingredients. The control feed had gone up to 10,000, across 10,000 Indonesian rupiah. And the savings this time with 15% DDGS we manage a 3% savings in the diet formulation. So this is the advantage that we were able to show. So the conclusions here is that with a two-stage approach, we were able to simulate the commercial cycle of shrimp culture from one gram right up to 19 grams. We had survival rates of more than 66% and weight gains of over 250%. The final body weight, the weight gain, the FCR, as well as the survival rates did not differ significantly across the control nor the treatment diets. We conclude that the results indicate that corn DDGS can be used up to 15% as an alternative ingredient in shrimp diets. And what is important here is the advantage. The diet costs show that shrimp feed prices can be reduced with the use of corn DDGS. Let me move on to the high pro DDGS, also known as corn fermented, fermented protein. And what would be the effect of using corn fermented protein in diets on the growth performance of uh, Lithopinus venomi. This trial was done by Romy together with um, the people from a company producing corn fermented protein. And it was done over a 53 day feeding period. The stocking density is equivalent to 150 shrimp per square meter in tanks. And there were four treatments, the control, 6% CFP, 12% CFP, and 18% CFP. The trial was done with five replicates. So there were a total of 
20 aquarium tanks. So here we find the diet formulation. The CFP replaced soybean meal as well as corn gluten meal. But this trial also tried replacing some of the fish meal. And it was also interesting because it removed um, corn gluten meal totally out of the formulation in CFP 12% and CFP 18%, right? So let's see what the results are. In the uh, final biomass, it showed that with 6% and 12%, including 18% as well, it performed better than the control. The final mean weight was also better than the control. This is statistically different. The survival rates were slightly better, but you can easily see a weight gain improvement. The FCRs were slightly better. And what we're trying to show here is that growth performance of um, feed with DDGS, high pro DDGS in it is very good for Little Pineas Venome. So our conclusion here is that the inclusion of 6% and 12% CFP in the shrimp significantly improved the final mean weight, the survival, the weight gain compared to the control. The inclusion of 6% and 12% CFP could reduce the requirement of soybean meal and corn gluten meal while the inclusion rate of 12% could easily replace the use of corn gluten meal. And here, the inclusion rate of 18% CFP could reduce the requirement of fish meal. And this would certainly help when we're looking at certification programs which require the feed company to reduce their fish meal inclusion. Right. Thank you very much. That is my presentation. And um, I apologize, I won't be there to answer your questions purely because of the time difference. But I hope that you've enjoyed the presentation as much as I have uh, done sharing this with you. Thank you very much. Agradecemos la participación de Ronnie Tan, de US